This is Samuel F. Robinson here with Mr. Julio Caceres, <laughs> founder and CEO of BRICS, of Fractional Investing. This is going to be an interesting topic that we're going to get into. We're going to discuss what is fractional investing, what it means to you as a consumer, and how is it being impacted by AI. This and more in this episode. Stay tuned. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. Tell us about yourself. Oh, thank you very much, Sam. I appreciate being on your show. Um, where do I begin, right? So I am uh, the founder and CEO of Bricks Professional Technologies and Holding Corporation. What we do is we help a lot of people in the investment side, as well as we help a lot of people that own properties that they rent. Um, we fractionalize their properties and we show them the different ways and we'll discuss the different topics and different terms of what they mean and definitions. And we'll show people how they could get involved in real estate investing for as little as $100. It's not a rich quick scheme. It's not one of those things overnight. It actually takes a little discipline and a little knowledge. And it's something that if you do, you could start building up your passive income monthly or quarterly or annually, depends what you want to do. And you start investing in real world assets. So you mentioned real world assets. Of course, for someone in like me in the digital age, hmm. there's a big difference between digital real estate and land. Tell us what you mean by real world asset, because that definition could be different based on the generation you're talking to. No, that's correct. Thank you. So when we're talking about digital assets, then we're talking about like the metaverse or blockchains or tokenizations or so many different terms that have come out. And when you're investing in some of these, it, it's not real. It's not tangible. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't go to it and see it, whether it's a piece of land, whether it's a property, whether it's a multifamily building. It, it's, it's all in the metaverse and in the blockchain. I'm repeating myself, but it's, it's digital. It's not real. Got it. When it comes to real estate, of course, you have residential real estate, you have commercial real estate. If I'm just a family, would it make sense for me to fractionalize my house? And first, what is fractionalization? Well, that's a good question, right? The majority of investors that we have right now are, we have 11.2 million people in the United States as of, as of 2023, 2024, that have one to four homes that they own. And I'm not talking about their personal homes where they live. I'm talking about properties that they own, that they rent out as hobbies sometimes or as building wealth through you know through time for eventually when they do retire from their jobs or they build enough passive income to pay off their mortgages to pay off their expenses they make a little money every month those are really good ways to build wealth and after you know 25 30 years when the mortgages are paid off now they have these four properties that are actually give them a nice compared to their retirements, compared to their pensions and their 401ks, and maybe if they're old enough, their social security benefits. It's an awesome way to build wealth through real estate. As we all know, 88% of all multimillionaires right now did it through real estate. Mm. I love it. I want to take a step back so that people understand the authority from which you speak. Tell us about how you got to where you are now. Where did, where did this all begin? Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, I was, I'm an immigrant, right? Came from Colombia. My mother's Colombian. My father's from Spain. Came here when I was six years old. I was very lucky to have the parents that I had. Was uh, Miami, Florida. Went to elementary, middle school, and high school here. I was always excelling at math. I, I did very well through math, and I was very advanced in math. Uh, I got accepted into NYU, but at that time I graduated very early from high school. I was 17 years old and I couldn't go to NYU because my parents made just enough to I could get accepted and I could go to these places, but not enough for grants because I was in 18, I was 17 and not enough to get uh, loans and, you know, like student loans to be able to do this. 
So unfortunately, even though I got accepted to NYU and some other great colleges, I ended up going into the Marine Corps. I decided, okay, well, let me pay my way for college and serve my military and be a patriot and, and serve the United States. So I did that. I went four years into the Marine Corps. I got out honorable discharge. After that, I got recruited into a few programs in Homeland Security. I started with TSA. After TSA, I started working for U.S. Customs and Border Protection. I did that for 22 years, and then eventually I, I fell off and I retired and I was out of that. Um, I didn't know what to do at that point in my life, but I continued my studies during the military and through Homeland Security, and I kept on advancing in math, and I kept on advancing in higher levels of higher education through math and different you know, financial math, and it just goes on and on and on, everything that I did. So I started consulting and analyzing for banks. I started becoming an underwriter, then I became a master underwriter. I started becoming a fee structurist, amortization specialist, timeline specialist through amortizations. I did so many back-end consultations for the banks, and I started getting hiring by different local banks here in Miami, Florida. Uh, during that time, I learned the mortgage industry very well, as well as becoming you know, a loan underwriter and a loan, you know, everything to do with math on the back end of the banks. I decided I wanted to learn how to create wealth, not only for myself and my family, but for people around me. And it was very difficult. It's very difficult because you have to have a very nice income, but it's hard when you have a very nice income, but you have a family of four. Maybe you have a wife, you have kids. So even though you're making good money, you might be $80,000 a year, $100,000 a year. After taxes and after everything you have to pay, what's left over to invest? It's really, really difficult, right? And if you go to any bank right now and you want to buy a rental property, you need at least 20% down plus closing costs. So in Miami or you know anywhere you live, if you're doing that and you're buying, let's say, a $200,000, that means you need $40,000 just for the 20% plus another maybe $10,000 for closing costs. So you need 50 grand. Do you know how hard it is for a family to save that kind of money? It's very difficult. But I started through the banks seeing how the rich invest. And I said to myself, okay, obviously it takes a little bit of money to make money, but why is it they're always getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier when they do invest, right? And I started learning about something called the DST market, the Delaware Statutory Trust Market. It's a great market. It's amazing when you invest in that market, but your minimums there are half a million, a million, 1031 exchanges. There's a bunch of processes that you have to do to be able to do that, and the rich could afford nice lawyers and nice accountants, which the poor cannot, right? So how do we learn about that market? How can we get involved in that market? You can't. It's exclusive. It's for the one percenters in the United States, but it's an amazing way to build wealth. So I said to myself, what can I do to get involved in that market, even though I cannot penetrate the barriers to entry of that market because I don't have half a million dollars laying around, right? So I started doing mathematically and I started realizing the power of fractionalization. Fractionalization is exactly what you're thinking about right now. You get a piece of property, you fractionalize it, you break it into pieces, right? And then those pieces, you, you have something to do with those pieces and what are those pieces? Those pieces all belong into one big piece of property. If it's a rental income producing property, that means it's, it's like a business, treated like a business. You're receiving rent minus expenses, then's your net, right? So if you wanna do the same thing for that property, you have to put down 20%. Like I said in the example earlier, you have to put down 50,000, you buy the property for 200,000. That's kind of tough. But what about if you do that and then you fractionalize it and you get rid of the mortgage and now you're free and clear, you keep that 50,000, but then now you could reuse it again through investing fractionally. And so that starts becoming a passive income situation. And what you wanna do is, you don't want to property manage it yourself. You don't want to be the landlord. You don't want to deal with the tenants. You don't want to deal with the financials or the expenses. You want it to become a business. And that's where my company comes in and we do everything for you. And what you're getting is pure net. I hope that's a good definition, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> well, my takeaways from that is we have those that are accredited investors mm -hmm. and then we have non-accredited investors and you're working with non-accredited investors so that they can participate in this distribution of wealth, whether in whole or in part, in this case, in part, 
based on how many fractions they can hold determines the amount of interest they collect. Can you, before I ask you to go into light on the minute parts of that, I know I can get into the weeds. I just wanted you to introduce yourself and thank you for sharing that information about yourself. Now you guys have an idea of who you have here on the screen. So let's move forward on who is the best candidate to get into fractional investing? Is it that single family that you mentioned that doesn't have a lot, but just enough? Or is it that person who is working at McDonald's and they just want to get something in? Well, the truth is everybody and anybody could do this, right? The guy that's working at McDonald's that's 18 years old, you know, the police officer that's 33 risking his life out there for us. And, you know, the older person that's about to retire and is looking for passive income. This is a way for everybody to get involved. And yes, you're right. You don't need to be an accredited investor or non-accredited investor. It, it doesn't matter. If there's certain limitations to how much, you know, you can invest because of the SEC and FINRA. If you're an accredited investor, you can invest as much or as little as you want. If you're a non-accredited investor, you can invest up to 10% of your annual gross. And then they kind of cap you because they want to make sure that you're doing the right thing and that you're protected, your rights are protected, and the company is protecting you as well. With my company, we are certified and licensed by the SEC and FINRA. So we make sure that we do everything legal and that we make sure that we do everything regulated and audited and our financials are you know, mirrored through those agencies to protect not only yourself as an investor, but us as a company as well. Everybody and anybody has the opportunity to get involved. I mean, sometimes people tell me all the time, oh, I went out this weekend, I spent $200 on the weekend and dinners and this and that. I'm like, okay, that's nice. What does that do for your future except for throwing money away in the weekend, right? But if you would have put those same $200 in a fractionalized rental income producing property, now that starts to make you dividends. And if you're smart enough that you could reinvest those dividends, now you have compound dividends and compound investing, and you could start building your portfolio little by little without having to go and buy these properties, become a landlord, deal with the tenants, deal with, you know, my AC broke in the weekend. You start getting companies involved like my company and they do it for you. So it's, it's seamless. All you did was just invest you look at the different properties, you like one, I want to put money into this one, whether it's $100, $500, 1000 10000 it doesn't matter, it's up to you. And you can start small, see how it goes, and then as you like the product, as you like what you're doing, you just keep on reinvesting. If you don't, and it's not for you, it's okay as well. You invest, you hold for a little while, if you don't like it, you could just sell it and get out. That's simple. Thank you for that explanation. Fractional investing is not new. And there are many companies that are doing that now. What separates your company from the other companies out there? What makes you unique? Why people should choose you over the rest? Thank you. That's actually a great question. And you're right. Fractionalization, you're right, Sam. It's not new. Fractionalization has been around since the early 2000s with bigger companies. I can name a few. Uh, Fundrise is a big one. Realty Mogul is a big one. You know, I can name so many companies that have been around. Um, those companies in the beginning would only take accredited investors. So you had to have a lot of money to be involved in those companies. When they started taking non-accredited investors, it was a very good thing because it opened up that market, but there was a big problem. The assets that they were investing in, they will all be leveraged. They will all have mortgages and loans and debts against those assets. So even though if you were a non-accredited investor and you would invest, let's say in one of those companies and you say, Hey, I want to invest, you know, a thousand dollars. That's fine, but your thousand dollars was stuck there for two, three, five, seven years. Kind of how REITs work and how syndications work. So it was tough to have your money there if you don't make a lot of money. What about if you need your money? What about if you have a family emergency? What about if your car breaks down? You can't get your money out because the moment you try to, there's early termination fees, early withdrawal fees. There's all sorts of fees that they're going to hit you that by the time you get your money out, not only did you lose uh, what profits you could have made, but you also lost part of your capital. What makes us unique is the assets that we have 
have no mortgages, no leverages, no debt. So because of that, our hold times are drastically reduced. We've got it down to 90 days. So think about that. If I wanted to invest $1,000 before in one of these companies, I was held for three years. What about if after six months you didn't like it? You're like, wow, my money's stuck there and I'm stuck with these people for another two and a half years. There's nothing you could do or you could pull it out and lose money. That's fine. You could do that. With our company, we don't do that. You have 90 days, one quarter. If you don't like it after a quarter, just sell your share. We'll do it for you if you want. And that's it. You get all your money out and any of the profits that you made during those three months. So that's a big uniqueness and a big difference. Another thing that's really big about us is the risk. Our risk is very, very minimal because we have no assets. We have no, I'm sorry, we have assets, but we have no loans, no debts, no mortgages. So when you have a, what we call a true north pure rental income producing property, the only expenses you truly have are property management, insurance, taxes. You have maybe lawn care, pool care, depending what kind of property it is. If it's a condo, apartment, townhouse, if it's a single family home. So the rents, we always back up our rents because of this. And the expenses are so minimal that I could do a case study and examples for you guys on any of the ones that we do currently. And you will see like, wow, there's no debt, no mortgages, no loans. On top of that, there's my minimal expenses, which are transparent. You get to see that as an investor. You're like, oh, wow, I know how much they're paying for this expense. I know how much they're paying for insurance. I know how much they're paying for taxes. And whatever's left over gets divided through the fractional shares equally amongst all the investors, depending how many shares you purchased. Thank you for mentioning that. Two things that you mentioned gets divided equally. The person that originally owns the property that begins to fractionalize the property, is there any advantage for that person in terms of how much they get? Correct. So when we say equally, let's say we take a $250,000, know, $300,000 home that you know, bricks fractionalizes. Okay. And then we rent that home, let's say for number sakes and for argument's sakes, let's say we rent that home for $3,000 a month, okay? What we do is we take those $300,000 that that home is worth and we break that into 300 shares of 1,000 each. Make it very simple, right? So when somebody like Sam says, hey, I wanna buy one of those shares, now he owns one 300th of that home. So what does that do? That means he participates not only in the gross that's coming in, that 3,000, minus the expenses and whatever the net is, it gets divided by 300 shares and he gets his portion of that every single month. So it's seamless and transparent. Right, so what I understand is for the person who owns the home, it's in their best interest to have as many shares as possible. There's no other advantage in them being in that ownership position then? Well, no, there is advantages, of course. There's, there's many advantages. So let's say a different scenario is, you know, Sam brings us that home to bricks and he says, hey, I have this house. It's worth $300,000, but I owe a mortgage of 200. We're like, okay. And this home is rented at 3,000 a month right now. But because of my mortgage, my expenses, and everything that's associated with managing this home, I'm paying 2,000 a month. So that means you're only making a thousand, correct? And he'd be like, yes. Well, what about if we fractionalize it and get rid of that $200,000 mortgage? See, the mortgage is always the biggest expense of any property. By us eliminating that mortgage, those expenses that were 2,000 a month could be reduced to maybe 600, 700 a month, right? Because we just got rid of that big mortgage, correct? So now, instead of that home making a thousand a month for the homeowner, now it's making 2300 and that gets split evenly and he keeps 100 shares and he sold out 200 shares. So think about it. Now he's getting one third of that 2300 which before he was only getting 1000 So he makes more money, gets rid of the loan, gets rid of the mortgage, gets rid of the debt. His credit goes up, his FICO goes up and he has passive income. So when he goes to a bank, it's not looked at as a liability anymore. It's looked at as an asset. Because before you go to a bank and you want to get another loan for something else, wait a minute, you already have a loan with us for 200000 Even though you have it rented and all that, that's a liability. What about if the renter stops paying? What about if this happens? What about that happens? The bank's always trying to protect themselves first. But if you go to the bank now and you have this home and it's making you money and there is no mortgage, 
then they'll look at it as an asset. Kind of like how when they ask you, hey, do you have any stocks that are dividend stocks? Do you have any bonds? Do you have anything like that? When you do have that, the bank sees that as a pure asset. So it helps you grow your portfolio as well. Love that. I see all the benefits from the unseen portion of it. So in addition to being financially rewarding, it actually sets you up to look good to creditors such as the bank. When it comes to that entire process, let's say that a family decide that, you know what, we're good with the residual, but we want to take full possession of the home. Is that a lengthy process to buy back those shares or is it just a matter of just saying to the group, you know, turn those shares back over for whatever the dollar amount is. How does that part work? Oh, well, that's, that's very simple. As the homeowner, when you bring that home to us, you have the first right of refusal, right? So let's say Sam brings that home, he sells 200,000 to get rid of the mortgage. Those fractional investors got involved. Now, when those fractional investors want to sell back, Sam will have the first right to buy those back if he wants to, nobody's forced into anything. Also, those investors, they don't have to sell. Maybe they like the deal and they just want to continue holding on forever, right? Well, Sam has the first right. He could say, hey, I know you bought this share for a thousand. What about if I offered you a thousand fifty or a thousand eighty five or a thousand one hundred? Are you interested in selling me that share? Well, then it becomes a negotiation process, but nobody's forced. And since you have no mortgage and no debt, no loan, there's no risk, right? So it's a business. So it's basically like buying equity into the business, right? You bought a little equity, you make your monthly dividends, and then when the business goes up in value because homes appreciate in value, then you could, hey, let me buy some more equity back into this business by getting to those investors and say, hey, I know you bought it for this much. How about if I pay you this much? They could say yes, they could say no, they could renegotiate. I mean, it makes a lot of sense as an investor if I put in a thousand, Let's say I'm making a 9% a year. I'm making that money monthly. And then six months later, somebody says, hey, you bought it for a thousand, let me get a thousand fifty. Well, I just made 5% on top of those six months that I was making money. I just made 5%. And so I would sell my share back to Sam. Well, Sam recaptures that, that share. And then that share produces a monthly dividend that now adds to Sam's shares that he has in total. I love it. Now, at the beginning, we talked about all these other aspects of it and we wanted to touch on what on earth does all of this have to do with AI how is AI affecting your company and the industry of banking so that's a very loaded question because <laughs> right now AI even though it has advanced CRM systems it has advanced banking back-end systems it has advanced formulas and algorithms and a lot of things Unfortunately, it still hasn't reached fractionalization. Does it make it easier for us to fractionalize? In some aspects it does, but has it become seamless and automatic where I could now trust my AI to fractionalize for me? No, it has not. On top of that, you have to be regulated, right? You have to be regulated by the SEC and by FINRA. You have to be audited. You have to do S1 filings. AI cannot do those things for you. So unfortunately, you need legal, you need accounting, you need a lot to handle a company like this. AI is making it easier, like in marketing and digital and social media. There's a lot of things that AI is advancing really quickly. But when it comes to fractionalization, it still hasn't reached that point yet. And I say yet because we know AI is advancing at double, triple speed every few months. By the time we see it now, in six months from now, AI would advance almost double the power, triple the power. So eventually it will get there, but it's still not there yet. And as a forefront in fractionalization, we are taking as much advantage as we can in seeing what's coming up in AI so we could adapt it to us so we can make it even easier for the investor and for the company. So if the company has less fees, less employees, less draws, that's savings that we could pass on to the investor as well. I love it. Two things before we wrap up. One is, who, how do they reach you? And should other investors reach out to you or just homeowners? I say both. 
I say both right now, ever since we launched our company, the first thing that we wanted to do was get legal, right? We wanted to get SEC and FINRA approved and we took all the necessary steps. Right now, we're at a point now where we can start accepting homeowners and investors, right? So they could reach us to our website, www.realty, R-E-A-L-T-Y, bricks, B-R-I-X.com. And you could always send us an email if you want to find out more, info at realtybricks.com. All right. So that brings us to the end of this episode. I know I went a little bit over, but I'm sure you guys enjoyed all this information and what it means for you as an individual in 2024 and beyond. So again, my name is Samuel F. Robinson and Mr. Julio will be available to field your calls. He actually has presentations throughout the year so you can actually jump on one of his webinars mm. and get some information so that you can make an educated decision thank you again enjoy the rest of the day and see you in the next episode don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment thank you thank you sam